Um, I'm really excited to welcome Professor Mai Van Tran here today. Um, Dr. Tran's work on authoritarian politics in Myanmar, Myanmar really resonates with so many of the exciting conversations that are going on at Yale and elsewhere at the intersection of Southeast Asian studies and politics. Um, thanks largely to my colleague, Jim Scott. We have a longstanding interest in Myanmar here at Yale. And I'm really delighted to be able to host someone like Dr. Tran, who has recently completed a PhD supervised by our own former PhD student from Yale, Tom Papinski, who is at Cornell, and she completed her PhD in 2020. Dr. Tran's dissertation is a study of public activism under repression, and she uses historical case studies from Myanmar's pro-democracy movement during military rule to understand how pro-democracy movements operate under military rule. Given the recent coup in Myanmar and the return to military rule, I think I'm not alone in wanting to learn more about what her research has revealed and to try and think through it will help us understand. Help us understand. In addition to her scholarly work, Dr. Tran has worked policy research institutes and civic tech organizations in Myanmar to deliver insights and policy recommendations on topics concerning local governance, digital literacy, and online disinformation. Her recent analysis and commentaries on Burmese politics appeared on the Washington Post, Brookings Institution, Al Jazeera, Associated Press, and so on. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Tran to our virtual series. Her talk is entitled, Engineering Public Hostility Against Popular Movements, Tatmadaw's Suppressive Repertoire in Urban Myanmar. I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Tran. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for this uh, generous introduction, Eric. Um, just to clarify, I'm not a professor. <laughs> I got my doctorate degree, but <laughs> yeah, uh, not yet a professor. Um, but yeah, so so first of all, um, I just like to um, say thanks, like uh, to to also express my express my gratitude toward um, Eric as well as uh, toward the uh, Council of South Asian Studies at Yale for inviting me uh, for um, this occasion uh, for for this opportunity for for me to share about my um, research today. And um, and 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 um, yeah, and and I think even though I don't get to be um, at Yale physically, but at the same time, it's, it's still um, very nice that here that I, I still can see um, a few like familiar faces, as well as you know I can still get the attendance of a lot of the prominent scholars like in um, of course in in Burma studies here as well. So um, so uh, with, with that said, I'm very excited um, to present my work and also to to have you know um, hopefully a, a, a lively discussion um, afterward. Um, so yeah, so so um, uh, without for, further ado, I uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, so regarding the the, the, the talk today, um, so um, Eric has um, also briefly in, introduced, like gave a brief summary of my uh, dissertation. So um, this presentation is uh, it is also um, it, it comes from uh, the the dissertation itself, and 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 for uh, the the talk today, uh, my. Um, uh, my uh, my my presentation it, it will focuses on a particular part of the dissertation, which is on the um, suppressive repertoire, the strategies by the Burmese military, the Damada, um, you know, in terms of um, engineering and provoking public hostility against the popular urban pro democracy movement um, during military rule between 1988 and uh, 2010. Um, this talk it will proceed um, as follows. So, so first of all, I uh, will um, I, I, I will discuss a little bit in terms of the existing scholarship as well as the existing um, you know um, reports and and, and research um, on the uh, Burmese uh, military junta's suppression of dissent. Um, and uh, via this uh, this uh, brief um, the review, um, I would hope to show that uh, most of this um, existing studies um, uh, on this particular topic they um, have focused 
on analyzing the more straightforward tools of repression by the junta. Um, however, um, you know, there is a gap in terms of the understanding about uh, more deceptive strategies to mobilize public hostility against the protesters. So um, therefore, uh, and, and from there, I would proceed to the second part of the presentation where I aim to shed light on these uh, strategies by just opposing two case studies of popular pro-democracy protests. Um, one is the 4-8 uprising in 1988, and the uh, second is the Safran Revolution um, in 2007. And, um, and, you know, like uh, based on the, uh, uh, um, my analysis of original qualitative data, um, I um, hope that this talk, it will be, via this talk, I'll be able to show a, um, first of all, um, a typology of the military suppressive repertoire, as well as, you know, to, to show um, to um, the audience today, the uh, various effects of uh, these different strategy combinations. Um, and before I end the talk, I will also touch briefly on how the findings from my research would also have relevant implications uh, for the current situation in post-coup Myanmar, as well as for the you know, um, other situations of suppression of the civic space beyond Myanmar as well. So, um, so first of all, uh, what do we know in terms of the state repression of dissent um, in, in Myanmar? Um, according to um, existing um, independent reports, as well as academic uh, studies and research, um, the five decades of military dictatorship in Myanmar were a period of brutal repression against pro-democracy activism, right? like from the 1960s to the 1970s. Um, uh, to the 19, sorry, one second, 1980s um, up to the 1990s and throughout the 2000s. Uh, so during, you know, like these five decades, we, uh, what we have witnessed is um, how the military rule um, has uh, resulted in um, thousands of uh, casualties and deaths of the protesters, as well as thousands more arrests. Um, and these are the very, um, you know, like um, quite um, uh, well cited numbers uh, by the reports by Amnesty International, as well as reports by the special rapporteurs on the situation of human rights in Myanmar. Um, in addition, um, after each of the protest cycle, the Burmese military junta is also known to have further confined the domestic opposition movement toward a highly restricted form of party politics that the regime could control. Um, so in here, right, like um, uh, works by Christina Fink and Join Line, as well as Lina Bidi, uh, together offer a very informative description of how the government was determined to persecute dissidents. So the regime did so by making all of the dissident activities illegal, detaining thousands of prominent activists, and issuing arrest warrants for other um, thousands of activists in exile. Um, and on top of that, only allowing you know, political parties with no campaigning activities to be legal. Um, and during these five decades, um, although less well documented, uh, the regime leaders, they have also run multiple campaigns to vilify the opposition and mobilize for public hostility toward protesters. So also with a goal, right, to quell large scale dissent, yet compared to the more direct tools of repression, such as protest crackdowns, arrests and massacres, et cetera, the strategies to provoke public hostility uh, are much less analyzed. And most of the literature on this issue so far um, in the Myanmar context uh, only draws from either public propaganda by the military in uh, 1988 or, or around 1988, or, or a handful of activist accounts um, of the 1988 protest cycle. Um, okay, so um, for, for instance, right, so um, according to um, the work um, uh, where, uh, so uh, according to uh, Bertolt Lindner's um, depiction of the military coup that ended the 4 8 uprising um, on September 18, 1988. Um, in order to disseminate allegations of the uprising as harboring criminals, 
um, the state um, broadcasted um, and also labeled any protest participants as violent delinquents. And such type of intentional framing was also more blatant later on as the state also reported about the, um, uh, the uh, protesters as quote unquote destructive elements. Um, and uh, the junta even announced that most of the deaths on the September 18 were caused by uh, quote looters and other unsavory um, elements um, unquote. Uh, moreover, according to um, other studies, right, um, uh, according to a lot of studies, we also have found that after the uh, protests, uh, after the pro-democracy uprising in 1988, the military regime held a series of military press conferences um, accusing the uh, main opposition party at the time, the National League for Democracy, NLD, of being controlled by the Communist Party of Burma or foreign forces. Um, so, so most of these types of studies and reports that we have seen, uh, their materials have come from the public propaganda of um, the military um, junta. However, um, you know, we 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 do um, have you know have a glance, right? Like at the more deceptive strategies uh, via the work by Christina Fink, um, where she uh, quoted the experiences of student activists um, in 1988 who suspected that military agents in plain clothes were trying to provoke them toward committing violence or murder in order to create a chaotic situation so that the military would have a justification for clamp clamping down. Um, however, overall, right, like um, um, none of these types of studies or, or research and reports have been able to um, uh, examine um, fully the, the range of the various uh, strategies, um, both public as well as the uh, covert strategies to provoke um, um, public hostilities towards uh, the protest movement. And moreover, um, since, um, you know, due to the lack of evidence from the point of view of the, um, you know, pe people on the receiving end of these strategies, um, namely the protesters and, and the general public themselves, like we, um, like via this work, we also have not been able to really understand whether these state strategies, these types of st strategies, have they really, like um, how, how, how much have they had an, an effect? Um, so uh, therefore, um, this is the, the part that I would like to contribute with, with, with my research. Uh, and more specifically, in, in order to shed light on the state leaders accountability in manufacturing uh, public hostility toward protest movements, I analyzed uh, original first-hand evidence from two case studies of popular pro-democracy pro protests. Um, as I said before, the 4-8 uprising in 1988 and the Second Revolution in 2007. Not only are they unlikely cases for the emergence of civilian hostility toward the protest movements, but they also experienced two different combinations of state strategies, uh, which I will describe later on. Um, therefore, I find that studying the public response toward the uh, peaceful activists in these two cases will allow me to highlight the impacts of each type of the state repertoire. So, so first of all, the protest events in both uh, 1988 and 2007, um, they are unlikely cases for civilian disruption and hostility toward the protesters. Since these protests were highly popular and received widespread approval from the general public. And at the same time, the antagonism and grievances toward the military regime was also high. Um, so the 4-H or 8888 uprising witnessed its first main protest on August 8, 1988. And the uprising was a combination of a cycle of student activism in Yangon in the preceding months due to the students' uh, grievances toward General Ne Win's uh, one-party dictatorship. And from mid-August onward, the um, uprising then became um, like a festival during which the general public, including factory workers, farmers, office staff, artists, homemakers, civil servants, and soldiers throughout the country turned out in droves to demonstrate. However, almost one month later, the military staged a coup and brutally cracked down on the protesters, um, as I said before, on September 18, 1988. Um, later on, uh, as for the Saffron Revolution, 
Um, this is a, you know, a protest cycle that occurred uh, during September 2007. Um, and it earned its name because it was led by Burmese Buddhist monks whose robes usually have maroon saffron colors. The immediate cause was General Tan Shui government's sudden reduction in fuel subsidy that led to a large increase in fuel prices. And this brought hardship on the majority of the population who lived near or in poverty. As a result, the monks they also started to take to the streets all over the country. However, 10 days after the start of the main protest, um, starting on September 26, the security forces violently cracked down on the demonstrators um, and raided multiple monasteries at night. And so consequently, all of the saffron protests stopped um, around the end of September. But despite their popularity, um, both to 1988 and 2007 protest events faced many incidents where local residents either stay away from protest events or actively confronted and blocked protest marches. And moreover, the military um, itself also employed different combinations of strategies to provoke um, anti-protester hostility and legitimize state repression. So at first, um, in, as you can see in this table here, in both 1988 and 2007, as each protest was gaining popularity, the government um, did not crack down right away, but started broadcasting its allegations of protesters as criminals. Um, the regime avoided using the word protesters to describe the movement participants, but instead labeling them as uh, rioters um, in order to promote criminal images. And at the same time, the state agents, they um, also um, were part of a covert uh, strategy uh, where they disguised as civilian observers, um, penetrated the protests and committed violence towards security forces as well as towards civilian targets, such as attacking the police and, or destroying public properties. Um, in addition, in 1988, um, in order to manufacture images of um, uh, quote unquote anarchy, um, which is the word that, that the uh, regime later on used to, to describe the 1988 event. So in order to manufacture these type of anarchic images that would further sow dissension between protesters and the general public, and also to justify a military coup, the regime also covertly incited peaceful protesters and dissidents to commit violence against innocent civilians. So um, in order to uh, further examine, you know, like the um, different uh, methods um, of, of these, these type of strategies, as well as to examine, you know, like their varied effects, um, I would now turn to describing to you, uh, you know, the data that I have collected as well as the, um, how I'm planning to analyze them as well. So uh, during my field work, I conducted um, in-person semi-structured interviews and collected written accounts, uh, mostly by Yangong residents from diverse demographic and political backgrounds. And since I tried to mirror the geographical representation of Yangong residents in my sample, I can also take advantage of the largely accidental exposure and non-exposure to state strategies among the interviewees in order to highlight their effects, uh, the strategies effects on civilian responses. And in order to build trust with um, the interviewees while maximizing the diversity of the samples, um, of the sample, I also worked with private schools, libraries, and institutions in Yangon, and as well as their affiliates to recruit respondents. Um, the interview uh, process stopped once my sample um, reached, um, you know, like all of the uh, sampling criteria. As you can see in here regarding you know, the demographic as well as um, political representation and when the data also reached um, saturation, um, which means you know, when the new interview, data, new interview data was mostly redundant and also offered too little new information. Uh, for the written accounts, um, I collaborated with the same institutions to identify and collect published uh, autobiographies, memoirs, and interviews by former activists um, during, uh, you know, these two decades between 1988 and 2010 as well. 
So um, with these graphs here, you can also um, basically take a glance at the uh, distribution um, of the different types of demographics, like um, among the uh, respondents and, and among the uh, people uh, where, who's, who's written accounts that I have collected here. Um, right, so based on these data, um, you know, when I, um, uh, based on my analysis of these types of data, um, what have I found? Um, so first of all, regarding the state strategies to frame protesters uh, for violence, um, during both the 1988 and um, 2007 events, many interviewees recalled how the government spread news through uh, mass media that uh, rioters hid among monks and laymen demonstrators in order to rob properties, poison food and water, uh, burn down cars, and destroy traffic lights, offices, and households. Uh, by broadcasting about multiple communal unrest across different townships in Yangon, the authorities uh, wanted to make the public perceive an immediate threat from uh, quote-unquote saboteurs mixing among pro protesters. And these types of news reach uh, many neighborhoods. And as a result, uh, most of my interviewees heard these rumors, even though they did not actually, uh, might not have uh, actually witnessed the alleged uh, sabotage, right? Um, so this is one uh, uh, example here. Um, and at the same time in 1988, um, the regime also shut down government offices for weeks and also blamed the protesters for the shutdown, charging them with vandalizing these offices. Um, so um, in the next quote here, what you will find is that uh, this is a former civil servant who recalled how she received uh, news, quote unquote news, about her office's destruction um, in advance. Yeah. And secondly, uh, in order to um, further produce um, the optical illusions of protesters as criminals, the state, they use their own agents to infiltrate peaceful protests and instigate riots. Um, in 1988, the state agents committed um, arsons and carry out robberies in different townships so as to make local residents believe in their allegations. And in 2007, um, these Asians um, also attacked the security forces with bricks and rocks so that the military could use this as a justification for soldiers to shoot protesters later on. Um, and as you can see from these quotes here, uh, multiple protest participants and observers um, have detailed these types of accounts as well. Um, right. Mm -hmm. um, but not stopping there, right? So um, at the height um, of the 4-8 um, uh, uprising, uh, the, the, the state itself was also involved in inciting protesters toward committing violence toward um, uh, civilians. So what happens? Um, at the height of the Fourth Uprising, the state um, they um, had uh, uh, they released prisoners and also had these prisoners poison the public water sources that the protesters drank. And uh, and on top of that, they also hired people to attack these activists as well. And multiple residents in Yangon witnessed these attempts. However, as the Rangoon uh, General uh, Strike Committee at the time was worried about the government scheme to frame the people's uprising um, as chaotic and as anarchic, they released a public statement requesting people not to harm and not to kill the alleged criminals. Uh, former student activists in Yangon in 1988 Likewise, here also recall how they were involved in detaining the alleged criminals, but did not condone killing them. And um, in another example, um, you know, uh, provided by the written accounts by um, a um, strike committee member um, himself, um, after his strike committee caught a monk with um, three jingalis, which were um, homemade um, weapons, um, the, 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 the committee uh, just interrogated this monk, confiscated the jingali, and then let the monk go. 
Um, so uh, overall, right, the, um, the General Strike Committee at that time, they also tried very hard to make sure that they could control these different protesters and strike groups and strike committees um, so as to make sure that they are, uh, you know, uh, do, do not um, commit uh, violence against uh, innocent civilians. Um, therefore, according to uh, many activists and observers in 1988, in order to incite protesters towards suspecting and also killing innocent civilians, the military resorted to using agents provocateurs. So first, um, in cases where the strike committees capture alleged criminals, the state agents, um, they infiltrated the public interrogations and also provoked uh, public anger, um, which drove people to behave those that they had arrested without concrete evidence of crimes. Um, and one Yangon resident uh, described such intervention here. Um, and many other witnesses, um, they also corroborate the presence of state agents in inciting brutal punishment of captured uh, criminal suspects in similar cases as well. And this is just um, one, uh, one of those quotes. Um, and immediately afterwards, the government, they also arrested the strike committee members to whom uh, whom is, is Asians um, had earlier provoked. And um, finally, uh, the state Asians at the same time, they photographed and filmed these incidents of public executions and broadcast them as evidence of the uprising's anarchy. The state's uh, next strategy was uh, drugging protesters and strike committee members in order to make them vulnerable to manipulation into publicly executing innocent people. Not only did they drug people, but in many cases, they even arrested these protesters uh, later on in order to um, cover up like their involvement as well. Um, so um, here is a quote um, by a resident in the town of Malamyai who recalled how one of her acquaintances um, also fell into this trap. And um, last but not least, um, state agents, they provided guns and homemade weapons to neighborhood uh, strike committees in order to facilitate violent attacks and later on uh, also arrested or executed these people as well. So a former student activist here in 1988 uh, describes how her adoptive father was framed here. Um, and um, another uh, student union member in uh, Yenanjong, um, in the town of Yenanjong, um, whose name is Momang Wun, um, he also met the same fate. So at the height of the 4-8, the police in Yenanjong offered to work with the student union to take care of the city's security. Um, the police chief himself also gave Mom Mom Wun a gun in the name of equipping the student union to provide law and order. And uh, Mom Mom Wun, um, as a result, was later accused of stealing this gun and also was jailed for two years. So overall, right, like um, um, I just wanted to review um, here in terms of the um, two different types of strategies, uh, strategy combinations um, that the military, they employed in 1988 versus in 2007, right? So in 2007, whereas most of the strategies have focused on framing protesters for uh, violence uh, towards civilians um, in 1988, um, there was also they 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 complemented these type of strategies with the incitement to toward uh, uh, mob violence um, against uh, uh, um, uh, the innocent civilians as well. Uh, and you know these these state in terms of the effect of these types of strategies on the public perception of the protest, um, they these strategies they made local residents consider um, every protesters a potential threat. Right. Um, even in cases where people suspected that the government, you know, like had um, a role to play in, in these types of um, incidents um, and they suspected the covert operation by the government. But uh, many of the people that I interviewed, they still became wary of the Asians provocateurs hiding among protest groups, as, it's, as you can see in, in this quote here. 
And uh, moreover, in 1988, right, like um, many people were also legitimately frightened by the killings and beheadings of civilians. A resident of um, South Oklahoma Township in 1988 in this quote here uh, shares um, her traumatic memory. Mm -hmm. And an interviewee who um, actually also um, lived um, outside of Yangon in 1988 also knew about these, um, these killings like uh, via uh, the state uh, TV uh, broadcast. And, uh, and, and therefore, um, you know, he himself was also negatively affected by um, this, this type of news as well. So um, therefore, as you can see, um, people in general did perceive a certain level of threat uh, from the protesters and from the dissidents. And um, depending on the level of threat perception, as well as depending on their, um, the, the um, members of the public, their um, social um, and gender expectations, um, what I find is that these protest observers, they either passively avoided uh, protest events uh, or withdrew their support to protesters or actively blocked protest marches and confronted protesters. So, um, so first of all, regarding the passive hostility. So what I find is that since the direct confrontation, um, you know, was considered, was perceived by uh, many people as a high risk act where people might have to engage in, uh, violently with the protesters, right? That could in, uh, result in casualties. Most people tended to stay away from crowds that were alleged to uh, harbor saboteurs or criminals um, or rioters. And as a result, um, in 1988, um, people would rather stay safe at home and um, guard their own places instead of going outside to support uh, protests. And similarly, since the beginning of the 2007 events, um, due to fear of criminals uh, mixing among the protesters, uh, many interviewees, uh, they also stayed away from protest areas and avoided traveling out of town as it was considered um, unsafe. Uh, moreover, right, so uh, regarding active hostility, according to, um, oh, sorry, uh, before I go to that, so according to my interviewees, most of the bystanders, they also, they, um, they, they also did not intervene, they chose not to intervene when the military or the police dealt with the accused, uh, quote unquote, uh, rioters or criminals um, in 1988 or in 2007. Um, as people consider um, these protesters as threat, um, they became reluctant to support or help during government crackdowns. And furthermore, right, like in the latter days of, uh, of the 4-8 uprising, uh, due to a high level of threat perception, uh, adult men from various neighborhoods, they also became uh, morally obliged to secure their own streets and confront protesters. And in a matter of days, um, Yangon transformed from a friendly and peaceful community into a hostile environment for public demonstrations, um, as uh, many of my interviewees recall here. Um, and the, uh, the, these uh, type of uh, neighborhood self-organized vigilante teams, they also armed themselves and blocked uh, protests um, from passing through their areas in order to avoid a uh, risk of violence directed at their families and at their neighbors, as you can see in these two quotes. Mm. And due to these forms of um, active hostility, um, it has a direct effect on the pro-democracy movement itself. A, um, and here in this quote, you can see a uh, former student activist um, describing the difficulty of carrying out public protests at the time due to the neighborhood uh, vigilantes like blocking the streets. And uh, moreover, right, um, another um, uh, former student activist um, also commented on how um, the state strategies, they generated uh, widespread dissension and also led to um, separation between the, the general public um, and the student protesters, um, which um, according to him was one of the main reasons why the, the protest failed uh, in, in the end in, in 1988. Right. So um, 
in the next section, um, you know, uh, I would like to go through the alternative explanations for, for, for these phenomena. I'm sure that uh, some of you might also have those questions in mind as well. So uh, first of all, uh, my, my, the first alternative explanation uh, is uh, regarding the government threat, uh, sorry, uh, regarding government reward, right? So uh, were the disruptive and hostile civilians, like mostly uh, people who received uh, uh, rewards from the regime, um, so from many of the existing studies, as well as reports, we know that um, state hired uh, violent agents have uh, been involved in attacking pro-democracy activists in Myanmar. Right? So for example, a, a student activist in 1988, um, among my interviewees also remembers how the government appointed administrators in his own word, uh, who clearly were regime supporters, requested informers to come watch and arrest activists in his area. And in 2007, uh, another witness who lived near the protest site also recalled how the state hired thugs came to crush the protesters as well. Um, and um, other um, studies have also shown, right, like um, based on the um, in, uh, information and evidence that they have gathered, uh, they have also described how in some cases of um, the civilian disruption in 1988, uh, that people were hired and trained uh, to attack and kill the protesters. Um, so, however, since the Burmese dictatorship, since they limited the number of the reward recipients and the hired agents, even though these people were involved in anti-protester violence, they did not make up the majority of the cases. And indeed, like most of the civilians um, who disrupted the activists or who became hostile toward the activists, as I find from my own interview data, um, they did not receive rewards um, prior to the actions. And in fact, like most of the um, urban Burmese population at that time uh, were burdened, uh, you know, like by poor public services and lack of social security, which made them become dissatisfied with the regime at the first place. And therefore, civilian hostility in my case studies was mostly not motivated by the regime's reward. And, and how about the government threat? Right. So were members of the general public uh, threatened to cooperate with the government crackdown? Um, leading to hostility and, and disruption toward the protesters. Um, even though the security forces, they didn't threaten civilians, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of, uh, 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 sorry, even though the security forces, they, they did threaten the, the civilians, I, I find that actually this did not have any significant effect in terms of the civilian hostility in, in the cases of 1988 and 2007 events. So first of all, people might have been threatened to stay away from protest sites or not to support the protests. Um, but there was no evidence that um, they were forced to actively confront or to actively block the activists. And second, um, you know, uh, among my, the uh, people that I ha have interviewed, um, if uh, they themselves have experienced like these types of threat, like from the military, from the soldiers, from the police, uh, telling them, requesting them, right, like uh, uh, not to go out to to support or, or to watch the protest event. Um, they 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 would detail those kinds of um, experiences, um, you know, very clearly, right. But at the same time, like as they were talking about that, um, they they also express, right, like how their own traumatic, uh, you know, impression of um, the um, rumors about violence or the actual violence that the protesters and the dissidents um, uh, had carried out also had, um, you know, uh, uh, made them become uh, more reluctant as well as more um, uh, the um, feel, feeling more threatened and also um, becoming more hostile toward these these protesters as well. So, so, so those two things, they could also happen at the same time. And, and, and the interviewees, they, 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 they uh, were readily shared about those types of experiences. And secondly, like many interviewees, they also detailed um, how their neighbors and uh, their mosques, uh, pagodas and churches even refused to comply with the government's order. And many of them um, also offer shelter to the movement participants. So um, therefore, the government threats were mostly irrelevant in these case studies in terms of shaping the uh, civilian hostility and, and disruption. 
Um, and what about in terms of ethnic difference, right? So in this case, as Burma Buddhists were thought to make up, I mean, they, they make up the vast majority of the population and therefore they also were thought to make up the vast majority of the urban pro-democracy protesters. So in this case, uh, were non Burma like more likely to engage in civilian, uh, in, in disruption and, and in hostilities toward the protesters? Um, so, uh, based on you know the uh, the data that I have collected, um, there are cases where the existing ethnic tension um, hindered a non bama from supporting the activists. So, for instance, a Karen man uh, who is an uh, ethnic minority living in Yangon in 2007. Um, he shared how his um, Karen neighborhood was not really bothered much by the state repression of the ethnic Burma monks and protesters. And this is because many minority ethnic populations, they, um, uh, they regarded uh, Burma people um, as their oppressors for decades. Um, therefore, the protesters' um, ethnicity background also made them appear um, as uh, quote unquote villains uh, to these minority neighborhoods and also deter the um, support from, from these neighborhoods toward the protesters um, as well. Um, however, like even though, you know, like um, this is uh, one instance that, that I have found like uh, during my interview, uh, but other evidence that, that I have, um, you know, like collected uh, uh, via my uh, field work have also shown that uh, um, um, observers who were Burma Buddhists themselves, right, they um, uh, were also engaged, right, like in um, these forms of hostility and these forms of disruption um, due to the impression Right, like of the protesters as a um, dangerous, a physical threat to their neighborhood. So, um, so um, overall, right, I, I also think that these, these um, um, findings from, from my research, and they also have um, relevant implications for the current case of the post-coup Myanmar in 2021 as well. Um, so from most uh, of the existing reports and studies uh, that we have seen, uh, the Tamara, they uh, recently they have also used very um, similar types of uh, uh, strategies, uh, both, uh, you know, uh, employing public as well as covert propaganda to manipulate narratives about protesters and frame them as criminals in order to turn public opinion against the resistance and in favor of state repression, right? So um, with regard to public propaganda to frame protesters of conducting violence against public interests, uh, for, for example, the military control Miyawadi TV, they recently aired an interview with a monk who claimed that NLD supporters burned down a village and also compare NLD to the Taliban, right? Uh, which is, is uh, essentially associating NLD members with criminal images that would resonate with the majority of Burmese Buddhist audience, uh, many of whom might also have discrimination against people of Muslim heritage. And, and in a similar vein, um, in uh, just last June, the state media report, they also accused the um, national unity government and uh, other resistance forces of, uh, quote, um, communicating with uh, international um, terrorists and the uh, ARSA, the Rohingya Muslim insurgent group, to grasp the state power by force, um, unquote. Uh, moreover, the military controlled uh, Ministry of Information, they have also started publishing books that accuse the anti regime movement of being a quote unquote a revolution to bring back vote cheaters. Um, the military also disseminated newsletters that label protests as uh, rioters as anarchic and you know, as uh, sabotage activity. So very similar types of rhetorics that um, you know, we have witnessed um, back in, uh, you know, before 2010 as well. On top of that, um, regarding uh, with covert strategies, um, the Tamara recently they has also have uh, mastered um, in their social media repertoire and, and therefore they have spread online disinformation under the guise of ordinary observers in order to um, build an echo chamber, right? A fake echo chamber reinforcing their official propaganda. And numerous reports have found that state coordinated trolls to have engaged in disseminating disinformation about anti government protesters with false accusations and manipulated images of violence. So, for example, as you can see, you know, like in these kinds of um, images on, on social media, the pro military social media accounts, they claim that security forces 
did not kill protesters, but it was a third party that was responsible, uh, referring to other protesters and other members of uh, resistance, different resistance forces. And some protesters were even falsely accused of killing the police or raping women. Um, other pro-military accounts um, have also accused anti-regime dissidents who have turned to violent methods of being manipulated by foreign forces and uh, Islamist groups like the ISIS and the Taliban, and even suggest uh, without uh, evidence that uh, Muslims were behind the attacks. Yeah. So uh, not only in the post-school Myanmar in 2020, we would also find uh, you know, very similar and familiar uh, types of strategies in uh, other cases um, beyond Myanmar as well. Um, so um, based on my own you know, survey of the existing literature as well as existing reports um, on uh, the uh, state suppression of the civic space, um, other state leaders have also combined you know, like, um, these um, uh, strategies either in terms of framing protesters for violence or inciting protesters toward uh, you know, committing violence um, toward uh, civilian targets. Um, they have also com uh, combined these types of strategies in order to provoke um, anti-protesters um, hostility. Right? So in this table, you can find like, some of those examples where state leaders across Asia, Europe, and Africa and the Americas have simultaneously spread disinformation both publicly and covertly. And going one step further, like toward a number of targeted movements, the political elites um, in the US, UK, and Mexico, uh, not only actively vilified uh, the protesters, but also uh, employed Asians provocateurs who urged, uh, funded, and also armed uh, protesters' uh, violent sabotage as well. Um, so, uh, so uh, therefore, right, like as we can see, um, these um, very uh, familiar strategies uh, being employed in um, different uh, regime, uh, political regime contexts, and also in the current context of Myanmar, um, I, I hope that the, the findings um, that um, I have presented today, like based on my research on, on the case of Myanmar between um, 1988 and 2010, could also offer right, some insights um, and also some uh, um, uh, relevant perspectives to help us um, uh, um, understand um, the uh, um, implications of, of these uh, strategies um, in the case of the post school Myanmar and in other cases around the world as well. So um, yeah, so, so in conclusion, um, by conducting uh, the analysis like on the emergence of civilian hostility toward pro-democracy protests in the Myanmar context, um, you know, I uh, would say that, you know, like my, uh, my, my research right now, it complements the current literature um, on the 1988 and the 2007 events by presenting a more comprehensive picture of an important yet uh, largely neglected component of the state suppression strategies um, toward dissent. And by illustrating these mechanisms, I also hope to contribute to the Burma Studies literature um, by refuting the claims that the mob participants uh, in 1988 were um, exceptional or um, were um, a particularly um, quote unquote savage, right? Like in any sense. Um, they did not automatically become violent when there were no functioning state institutions. And as the, uh, as the Myanmar junta and some scholars um, have claimed, um, on the other hand, like most people, they were disgusted and they were traumatized by the public executions of the um, criminal suspects. Um, and the strike committee members, um, moreover, they were mainly under the influence of the state uh, incitement when they engaged in such types of collective assaults. And um, my studies also makes contributions here toward the social movement and the authoritarianism literature as well. So first it highlights the authoritarian regime's deceptive tactics as an important part in their toolbox to manufacture a hostile environment for contentious actors and in order to suppress the sense. And this would also deepen our understanding of mechanisms for authoritarian survival, like especially during critical times of public uprisings, beyond the conventional models of co-optation and repression. Um, and I propose that this, this, um, this finding can serve as a unique and valuable evidence for advocacy against the suppression of civic space as human rights activists and journalists, they might expose the um, covert strategies and raise awareness among the general public and international community in order to deter the state leaders from employing these tactics um, in the future. 
And in another part of my dissertation, I also find that activists might also neutralize these state strategies by um, actively debunking the state disinformation, um, you know, by uh, staying vigilant to the uh, incitement to, to violence, and also by coordinating um, uh, so collective support like from uh, the general public toward protesters and the resulting support and protection by the civilians in contrast to hostile disruption would increase the activist survival and commitment to the movement and foster movement resilience in the face of state um, uh, in the face of state repression as well um, however due to the constraint of the uh, presentation um, time today so I, I think um, I would uh, probably um, if you're interested in reading more about that part of my research I infer, um, I, I can also share with you uh, my, my my dissertation a copy of my dissertation as well so um, thank you very much for listening Thank you, Van. This is a really fascinating talk. Uh, I, I'm going to open it up uh, to discussion now. Um, I will moderate. I have some questions of my own, but I'll reserve them until we get a few from people in the audience here. Um, so if you can raise your hand using the, 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 the chat function, not the chat function, but the reaction function, um, then I'll see your hand go up. Um, but I see that we have two questions in the chat already. So let me ask, um, I'll start with uh, Lisa Bruton. Uh, if you don't mind just asking your question or if you prefer me to read it, I will read it. Um, and then there's another question um, from Jackson Vaughn. And then while we take these questions, anyone else put your hand up and I will uh, find a time to call on you. So I am happy to read my, I'm ahead. happy to ask directly. Yeah. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about what you see in terms of differences of citizen responses today compared to those who you, um, to, today, to today's state violence and state dis and misinformation compared to what your respondents told you about the situation in uh, uh, 88 and 2007. Um, yes, um, thank you very much for, for your question, um, Lisa. So um, I think, you know, like, um, so um, just uh, in, in terms of the, the work that I'm, I'm currently conducting, like uh, uh, regarding the current situation. Um, um, so I have not really be, I've been able to conduct any kind of systematic study like where I could interview or survey people on, on the ground. Uh, most of uh, the work that I have been doing right now is in terms of um, uh, surveying the landscape of um, social media content in, in, in Myanmar. Um, and um, there, therefore, like based on that type of content, um, I, I think that um, there could also be, in, in a way, uh, findings that um, might, not be in, uh, might not be comparable to the situation before 2010, right? So uh, what I find in terms of the social media content that I, that, that I have analyzed so far in terms of the um, where, where I study the um, top uh, most viral content um, on, on, on Facebook in, in Myanmar during the past few months. Uh, most of the content uh, uh, in, in terms of on, online users in Myanmar, they have been very supportive like of the uh, pro-democracy content. And at the same time, they have also been very actively, um, actively exposing incidents of state violence online. And at the same time, regarding uh, the state mis and disinformation, um, you know, I, I show some of the examples, right, in, in the uh, presentation in, in terms of, you know, um, alleging um, an idea being associated with Taliban or ISIS or ARSA. Those types of uh, mis and disinformation are, are there and they exist. However, among the most viral contents, they do not make it to the top. Uh, which uh, could also indicate that most of the on online users and, and you know, they um, um, have been um, somewhat, right, be become uh, more vigilant against these types of uh, mis and disinformation. 
um, and um, you know, and 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 um, it could also indicate that by being online, right, be, being on social media, uh, these particular group uh, of population, they have also been more exposed to alternative and um, discourse, right, like, uh, from people that support the resistance itself, right. So, uh, which could also um, affect, you know, the the way that they view the um, state disinformation as well. However, I, I could not speak for, you know, in terms of the um, uh, uh, population who might not be online, right? Who uh, might not be exposed to 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 these types of um, uh, alternative discourses and also these um, efforts by um, activists to debunk the state disinformation on, on social media. So for people that, um, you know, like have uh, mostly consumed um, content via, uh, you know, traditional form of like TV or, or radio or newspaper, um, you know, um, I, I, that, that, that is a part that, that, that um, I think uh, uh, could have very different types of, of findings. Um, yeah, but I, I've yet been able to, to, to look into that yet. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, New, do you want to ask your question now? Yes, thank you, uh, Eric. And thank you, Wang, for a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. And, um, I, as you right now, find your research super interesting and relevant. Um, so my, my question have to do with trying to understand um, the logic of suppression or the logic of governance of the state in reaction or in relation to the to societal opposition. Um, and the question that I am what I'm not clear about um, is when and why would a state use this strategy? In other words, while we know that, and we can see as you showed in your last slide, this the combination of this sort of framing, trying to delegitimize the opposition versus the combination of also trying to incite violence, also to de delegitimize uh, opposition and protesters. These elements can be found in many other cases, right? In many incidents, both within um, Myanmar and outside Myanmar. So the question is, when, when would even the, the Myanmar government, when does the Myanmar government decide to apply the strategy and when it does not? And then why do some states do and why some states do not? Um, and that, that's something that I find, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, thank, thank you for the great question. You. So, so first of all, um, regarding, you know, like the, the question of, um, um, the decision by a state when or when not to use a certain type of strategy, um, I, uh, I, I, I don't have much confidence there, to, to be honest. I, I, I would say that I know when they, they do apply these types of strategies, uh, but, but it, uh, you know, in terms of why they decide to do so, I, I can only have guesses. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, particularly, you know, like, well, you know, um, in, in, in the case of, um, uh, the, uh, in the case of Myanmar before 2010, right, um, we could also find that there, there, there could be different reasons. So, so first of all, it, um, it, during 1988, like we have a um, different uh, uh, general at the top of the government versus in 2010, right? So um, they could have very different types of uh, strategies to suppress dissent. Um, and, 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 and furthermore, it, uh, you know, um, it could also be the case that as um, many people would also know, the scale of the uh, protests in 1988 was uh, much wider and, and much more, um, you know, uh, encompassing of the different groups of the population. So um, the traditional or more conventional, uh, more conservative um, type of strategies, right, to repress or to suppress dissent, and, um, you know, uh, uh, that they have tried might have not worked as much as they had hoped, and so therefore they added this additional step, right? But but at the same time, I think that um, you know. We, we also find that uh, the, these exact strategies, um, probably not, but very similar strategies, um, they have also been employed um, recently 
um, you know, like um, after um, the uh, by the uh, Myanmar military after the coup in February as well, um, due to the fact that a lot of the people that are you know on uh, the um, advisory council to the military right now, they uh, were also related to the uh, to to the Nguyen family or you know like to uh, the the, the uh, previous leaders of the previous regime. So so I think that there there could be different types of factors, right, um, regarding you know the uh, the 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 uh, I would say you know like the the the, the style um, of suppression of each of the um, leaders and at the same time it could also be the situation right um, that that they they find themselves under as well um, and and regarding you know like um, thinking um, broader uh, more 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 broadly in terms of you know beyond Myanmar in, in other case in other states and so first of all what I would like to say is that. Um, the data that I have right now, it might also be incomplete, right? Uh, especially regarding the covert strategies, we only know them when we have like these types of uh, information being released to the public, right? So uh, we only, for, for example, in, in the case um, of the, the um, uh, US um, COINTEL Pro op operation, uh, those are only know right? like after we already have like a public investigation into, uh, in, into these cases. So uh, it could also be that the application of, of these um, types of covert strategies are much more widespread, and, and the pattern could also look different from, from, from what we know now. However, uh, one thing that I, I think is, is also, um, uh, a, I, I, I think that could also offer maybe one possible explanation for the variation in terms of uh, which, which states do or, or do not um, employ these, these types of uh, strategies to provoke um, public hostility. Um, I, I would say that for um, uh, you know, certain states that are uh, and in certain regimes um, that uh, are more willing to directly crack down, to directly repress um, uh, protests, uh, you know, without fear of um, getting backlash from the public population, from the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the members of the public, uh, they would find less need to, 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 to employ um, these, these um, more covert uh, stra strategies. Yeah, and so that's just one possible explanation, but um, love to discuss more if you have other ideas. Thanks, uh, I'm gonna ask my question now. Um, there's a little mystery that I'm working with in my head as I'm listening to this talk. It's not your research. It's just like a question that I can't stop having. And it's about the methodology a little bit um, where you can conduct interviews with people and the people will say, look, I know that the state was sending agent provocateur or I know the state was inciting violence. I know X was happening, right? Like they are able in recounting and telling the story um, to distinguish the state's kind of provocations, all the elements that you've described, all the strategies and styles that you've described, right? Like people can figure it out, right? They're not fooled by it, right? At the same time, um, it seems to work in a weird way too, right? Like there's moments like in the heat of the moment, it seems almost that people, yeah, they do get kind of worried about those protesters and the and sit, maybe there's a seed of doubt or a concern that they don't know who's violent or not or something like that right and so I'm, I guess my question is how do we develop a kind of theory about the way in which people both know that the state is or the junta is doing this machination and, and trickery and deception right um, but at the same time they then feel themselves compelled almost to be a little bit worried about those protesters, even though they know the protesters actually they may politically be on the same side as them actually, right, in some sense, right? Um, have you thought a little bit about how to reconcile that kind of conundrum a little bit? And how is it that people, when they recount the story, can actually say, oh yeah, it was a state provocateur. But then when you look at your data, there's lots of people who don't realize that it seems, right? Um, yeah, so so I think to, to answer that question, I think like, uh, first of all, I think that there, there, there are two parts here, like in terms of the uh, what the state provocateurs, what 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 they did, right? Um, and um, these, uh, and, and also secondly, in terms of, you know, um, these types of actions, um, you know, what kind of effect they, they have, like on the protesters and on, on the kind of protest observers. 
Um, I would say that in terms of like recounting these types of experiences, um, like people um, could have pinpointed, right? Like in terms of a, like um, uh, these are um, instances where I, I find it like so strange that, you know, you, you would have like these people uh, who would come and uh, provoke violence, but at the same time, like um, later on, you, you find them like being ready with, with a camera. And then they are also the one who would like report, uh, you know, like to the state to, to arrest these types of people. So that, that's something that people can piece together. I do not think that is uh, very much in terms of like being uh, a cognitive dissonance, um, as you know, uh, people all, also find that they, they, they themselves are, are, are worried that um, sure, right? So um, uh, we might believe the protesters, however, um, you know, how many people out there are real protesters and how many people out there, they are the state A, A agents. And um, that is something that, you know, like uh, they do not know. And, and exactly like, I think that this, this is a type of strategy that I also find in a way um, uh, has been, um, uh, accountable, right? Like for um, uh, uh, in in, in uh, accountable for creating um, or um, or or increasing a, a yeah, distrust um, among society, and and this um, overall this this um, level of uh, distrust, right? Like uh, when um, when it increases, then 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 people would also find um, themselves to be less willing. To, to have, you know, like um, strangers interacting with them or, you know, to, to supporting um, these, these people that, that they don't know where they come from, what they have done or what they might do to, to, to their neighborhoods as well. So this is something um, that, um, you know, where even when people are aware of the state, state strategies, um, it doesn't mean that the strategies won't have effect. And um, this could also be something that the, the regime themselves, they, 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 they might have counted on um, as well. Yeah. Um, in, in some sense, the, the strategy um, plants so much uncertainty that it mm -hmm. creates, uh, it just makes it impossible to ever feel secure in who you know is, and who is who and what's going on, right? I mean, in some sense, um, it's kind of similar to this fake news phenomenon like once you plant the idea that there may be fake news you can't right, right. Un undo that uncertainty or right. something like that right yeah 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 i think that's 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 exactly the, the the case there um yeah and then like they like people um uh, in terms of at least in terms of people that i have interviewed uh they they they, they also find that uh you know um even if the protesters um, themselves they, they they did not um uh, originally plan to conduct um, violence against um, innocent civilians, but they are susceptible to word provocation to these types of violence. So um, this is something that also um, made, you know, a, a very, um, a, I would say, um, uh, 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 made the, 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 the civilian observers, uh, the, they, they have a very high level of, of um, threat perception, um, you know, regarding how, how they think about these, these, uh, these protesters. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Tui, do you want to ask your question now? Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I was impressed when I got the news about uh, the recent uh, is one John NC Vietnamese NC doing research in Perma. And that's very impressive. So, uh, and thank you for the, for the, an interesting uh, talk. Um, I am not doing research on like political science in, uh, uh, in Burma, but I'm interested in the demographic trap that you show. Like I see that there, there were more, more male, men than women in mm -hmm. the process and the, the, the percentage like the modern. The rest is like uh, in two thousand seven. It's the more men than than than, than women compared to nineteen ninety eight. and um, that's the and the protest. Uh, like some some times ago, like some some like one or two years last year or sometime. I I heard from the news. I'm not sure it's uh, the fake news or uh, like the real 
about the protest that the uh, the Burm Burma women they they protest they use underwear and they hang out underwear women underwear on the street to mm-hmm. to repent because they use like the tradition that the men don't cross the under the underwear of the women so that to me that's that's smart and that fun and smart mm-hmm. and it also remind yeah. me about uh, Vietnamese women movement uh, during the war. Uh, you may know about the saying, very famous say in Vietnam, like Yak Đến Nhà Đàn Bà Cũng Đán, and the Đồng Khởi, so Vietnamese Đồng Khởi movement during the war, during the American war in Vietnam. So uh, you are Vietnamese, you are doing research in, in Burma. So how how you see the, 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 the Burma women now? Compared to the Burmese women in Vietnam, like, and like to me, like I see because I'm doing research in it's related to history, women history. So I see like uh, during the war, women like Vietnamese women, we like but now we lose that that motivation that we lose that uh, effort. Now women Vietnamese women, we more like like accept what we have compared to before. So and, and in Burma, I'm so I see we see now like more male than female do doing protests. So like in your data or in your research, can you have more explanation on that? Because I, I see your your demographic graph, but I didn't see you mm-hmm. explain why. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll say so, thank thank you so much for for your questions. Um. So uh, I think that it's it's also like a a really great question too, because um, I think that you had probably like a a really sharp observation there, um, because um, also according to my own observation, right, and also based on studying the existing reports and documentations of the protest events like before 2010, um, most of them, uh, despite the fact that we have the leader of the main opposition party being women, but uh, most of the um, protest events at that time, they uh, were participated by men and, and uh, they, they also were also led by, by men as well. Um, I also had, uh, so, so during my field work, I also had to intentionally like, ask uh, you know, my interlocutors to help me to recruit uh, female in- interviewees, people who uh, themselves they will also experience um, and uh, either observed or, or directly participate in, in these, um, these types of protests. Um, and uh, at the same time, what, what we find is that these, these types of like um, rhetorics, like these uh, feminist um, re- rhetorics and, and these uh, feminist demands that we see um, in 2020, these are the things that I did not find at all in terms of the most popular demands or, or, or rhetorics like before 2010. So um, in a way, like to, to me, it was um, a, um, a very encouraging side and, and I really hope to, to see um, more of that type of development um, as, as, as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I hope that that, that answered your, your question somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Van, and thank you, Tweep, and everyone else for these great questions. Um, we're at the end of the formal time for our Q&A. Um, what I will do at this moment is stop the recording and then I'll leave the, the Zoom open for informal chit chat after this point. But please join me everyone for a moment to thank uh, Dr. Van John for this fantastic talk. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for attending for yeah, very interesting questions too. <laughs>